founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So today is Wednesday, December 7th, 2022, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. Well, look, I'm getting ready to teach uh, another session of my uh, online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And I wanted to come on and just talk for a few minutes about some of the content and some of what we'll talk and ask us. We wanted to get into uh, some of the history of the Moors in Spain, in Europe, generally speaking, but uh, especially in Spain. OK, so this is a um, uh, this time around, it's going to be at least 12 weeks. And we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded and watch it anytime. So we teach the class on Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, run a little behind schedule today. So we're going to start right around 815 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the information is in the thread of the broadcast. Uh, so you can uh, register for this uh, multi-week uh, online course. OK. All right. So um, we do a thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. Now, uh, we know that the United States was called Egypt of the West by many of the founding fathers. And when we look at Freemasonry, we see that uh, the foundation of Freemasonry are the teachings uh, coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the Nile Valley region of Africa. And these teachings, teachings are going to be taken uh, into Europe. And it's going to be these teachings that bring Europe out of the dark ages. So uh, in uh, today's class, one of the things we'll talk about uh is uh the dark ages the middle ages which is basically 476 a.d to uh going into the uh 13th century okay going into the 14th uh, going to the 14th century the 1300s and then the next um uh period after that is going to be the renaissance era and the renaissance era is going to be an era of enlightenment okay and europe is coming out of the dark ages and they start to conquer other people's lands now uh, there's a there's a good piece from uh, face to face Africa dot com that deals with uh, Cleopatra's needle and it deals with uh, uh, three Tekkens that uh, or what the Greeks call obelisk Tekken new or what the Greeks call obelisk obelisk, which um, comes from the mythology of Asar, Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus. And uh, you have these tech and new in uh, London, England. You have them in uh, New York City, okay, and also in Paris, France. And these were actually taken from Africa, okay? So we have symbols of Africa all around us, and we have to become history detectives to understand how to decode these symbols. Now, ancient Egyptians called the uh, called obelisks tech and new, and they were also used to tell time in the past. Their pinnacles were basically covered uh, in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say the obelisks represented immortality and eternity, and their long structure helped uh, connect the heavens and the earth. The long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Okay, so, uh, now currently Cleopas Needle is the name given to three ancient Kemetic or ancient Egyptian Tekkenu, or what the Greeks called obelisks, obelisks. Uh, one in New York City, one in London, England, and one in Paris, France. However, they do not all come from one Egyptian site. They do not call from they do not all come from one Egyptian site. OK, now you should be able to see the screen uh, clearly. Let me know how we're coming in. And I want to make sure uh, everybody can uh, uh, hear me as well. OK. All right. So uh, the obelisk in New York City and London, England, are carved out of red granite uh, from the quarries of Aswan and uh, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The two obelisks obelisks were commissioned the two obelisks were uh, commissioned by Nasubiti or Pharaoh uh, Thutmose III uh, for the temple of the son of Heliopolis the temple of the son of Heliopolis uh, near modern day Cairo with each weighing about 224 tons and they stand 68 feet tall 
Okay, now uh, there's a good article from face to face Africa.com called Cleopatra's Needle How Three Ancient Egyptian Obelisks Ended Up in New York City, London, England, and Paris, France. And what happens is, is we'll see these structures, okay? We'll see structures like Washington. Okay, people go on tour of Washington, D.C., and they look at the layout of Washington, D.C., and think the founding fathers were so great and things like this. But they don't understand that the inspiration for a, a lot of what we see is coming out of ancient Kemet, coming out of the Nile Valley region of Africa, coming out of ancient Africa. There were about 1,200 Tekanu all throughout ancient Kemet. Today, they're less than 12. Okay, but since we don't understand who we are, since we don't understand history, OK, people can steal our history, steal our symbols, represent them to the world like they invented the symbols themselves. And we'll look at them as being so great and look down upon ourselves, refer to ourselves in dehumanizing terms, call ourselves N word and bees and things like this. And don't understand that all this comes from us. OK, and, and, and many Europeans know this. Now, here's a, a famous statue of Asar Aset and Heru, the first holy trinity who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. When we when we read about uh, Heru being born uh, on December 25th of a virgin birth, we, 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 we see the retelling of this very ancient story over and over and over again, adapted to various people's cultures over thousands of years with different people's ethnicities represented uh, in the story. If you, if you follow Dr. Ray Hagens and watch some of his videos on our YouTube channel, and Dr. Ray Hagens is one of my teachers, as well as, as well as Dr. Leonard Jeffries and uh, Professor Kabahai Walter Kamane and Professor James Small and Dr. Claude Anderson. But Dr. Je about the, but, uh, uh, Dr. Ray Higgins has been teaching about this for years in the African village. Okay, now there were approximately uh, 1,200 Tekkenu built in ancient Kemet in ancient times, but only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu Okay, removed from ancient Kemet are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few people know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar, that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar. Now, if you read Egypt on the Potomac, by Tony Browder, and this is one of the books that we use in the online course. Now, you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in the class. We show you excerpts of the book on the screen, uh, usually. Um, and Browder is brilliant in this history. Browder does a tour of Washington, D.C. called Egypt on the Potomac. So he has the book called Egypt on the Potomac, okay? But he actually does a tour of Washington, D.C., and he takes people around Washington, D.C., and shows them how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Egypt. And he shows them the symbolism coming straight from Africa, coming straight from ancient Africa that we see in Washington, D.C. today that we associate with Europeans. OK, and we associate with the founding fathers in George Washington, and they were so great and they were so brilliant, even though many of them were slave owners. But they were heavily influenced by ancient Africa. OK, now many of us have been taught to hate Africa have been taught to hate Egypt, and we've been taught to run away from it while oppressors and colonizers run to it because they understand that's the source of knowledge, that's the source of power. Okay, now, uh, if we go to uh, the next slide here, uh, let's see, let's skip over this. And, and then when we look at Freemasonry, okay, directly connected to, to the Moors because the teachings that the Moors take into Europe are going to form the foundation of Freemasonry. Now, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun, the Latin words mass and sun. And Mason means child of light and expresses a desire to pursue light, a desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light were, was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, okay, the Pur Ankh, the house of life, which is what they call their, their, their uh, temples of learning, the Pur Ankh, the house of life. Now, uh, many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. 
okay places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees so the concept of going to number one going to a liberal arts college that concept of going to a liberal arts college comes from the teachings in the in the in the uh, in the temples in the in the grand lodges in the per onks the house of life um and then also when you look at when you read uh stolen legacy by George GM James and he talks about the trivium the quad and the quadrivium he talks about the seven liberal arts uh he he talks about the arithmetic and the rhetoric and the logic and things like this right the concept of liberal arts colleges comes from ancient Kemet okay it comes from ancient Africa this is this is coming from my ancestors okay so um we've gotten we've gotten so far from who we are we've allowed other people to define reality first power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own so much so where you have some of our people who think that college is not for them when we were the ones who created the concept of high institutions of higher learning and we were the ones who created the first institutions of higher learning and people came from around the world to attend those institutions of higher learning whether it's in ancient Kemet whether it's uh, the University of San Corre in in um, the city of Timbuktu and the Songhai and Mali empires, whether it's the University of Janae, we were the ones. And then when we go and we look at the Moors uh, and, and the University of Salamanca in Spain is built by Moors and, and, and Arabs right around 1285 um, A.D. OK. And when we look at a lot of the uh, oldest uh, uh, universities in um, in Europe. University of Toledo and uh, Barcelona, things like this. Many of the first instructors at those universities were African Moors. OK, but but we don't understand our history. Power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. So check out pages 18 and 32 of uh, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Now, Masonic temples are considered houses of light or temples of learning, houses of light or temples of learning. The term Mason or child of light is a direct reference to the highest degree of the ancient Kemetic education system. The 33 degrees of instruction within Freemasonry represent a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprise the ancient Kemetic mystery system or the ancient Kemetic system of education. Yet with less than 10 percent, with less than 10 percent of the wisdom of ancient Kemet, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. This is page 33 of Egypt on the Potomac. OK, so uh, the concept of going to an institution of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of degrees. OK, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, Ph.D., graduate's degree, things like this. That concept comes from the houses of life the per aunt that comes from ancient kemet many of us have gotten so far away from from who we are okay and what you do and and and, and what you do for yourself what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself what you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself what you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read heard and seen about yourself okay so when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts you can control the covers of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know now 50 of the 56 signers of the declaration of independence were freemasons what information did they have from ancient Kemet taken into Europe by the Africans known as the Moors? And 13 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons. Four of the first five U.S. presidents were Freemasons. And so far, 14 Freemasons have been U.S. presidents as well. OK, now, so we go through and we look at different aspects of history. And then uh, we definitely look at. Uh, uh some of the history of uh the moors in spain okay and you know we know the moors uh with the grenada war of granada war january 2nd 1492 which ends january 2nd 1492 basically we know uh that the moors lose control of their last stronghold which is in southern uh spain uh granada okay january 2nd 1492 now this is directly connected to christopher columbus because christopher columbus set sail um 
August 3rd, 1492, on the Nina de Penta and the Santa Maria, the day before Columbus sails, Spain expels the Sephardim, the Sephardic Jews, on August 2nd, 1492. All this take place, takes place in 1492, okay? And all this history, all this history is connected. Okay, so we go through and we look at uh, some of the history of the Moors, and, and this is some of what we'll teach in... Uh, uh, class today because I'm, I'm only here for a few minutes i have to jump out of here and uh teach today's class you can register for the course it's a 10-week online course that i teach ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school uh we have the link posted here on the thread of the broadcast also you can visit our website uh the african history network.com uh the african history network.com and uh, we have the information there. The class is on sale, uh, $60, regularly $130. We, and we're actually going to do about 12, either 12 or 13 sessions this time around. Um, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Normally, we do it on Wednesday, 7 p.m. to uh, 9 p.m. But my work schedule is changed, uh, keeps changing. So, um I, I, we're running a little behind uh today okay but we're still going to do it uh today and uh on tuesdays the class that i teach uh, 7 p.m to 9 p.m is from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power um 1865 to 1968 from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 uh we start in the year 1800 look at history chronologically year by year from 1800 through 1968 uh civil war Reconstruction era, Great Migration, World War One, World War Two, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, to understand what happened to us after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place to put to to bring us to where we are today? To better understand where we need to go from here. Okay, and we have both classes in the bundle pack. Uh, you get a, a limited time only. You can get both classes for hundred dollars. That's over two hundred sixty dollar value. You just click right here for register here. You can use debit card or credit card. Okay, or PayPal. All right. Now, if we look at um, so you can register for the class right now. Join us in class. We do the session live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so you can go back and watch it anytime. Also, so a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire. Of course, you'll have access to it. Okay, so we look at um, uh, some of the history of the Moors and going into Spain, it first going in 710 AD uh, for the reconnaissance mission, okay, by Tarif. Uh, and then they go on in 711 AD, led by General Tariq, Tariq Ibn Zia. All right, and this is, and when we look at um, Spain now in the in the eighth century it was it was called the iberian peninsula today we know in the, as spain and portugal you see spain and portugal right next to each other and the right above morocco so they're going right in uh from morocco a very short distance into spain and they fight against the vandals and the, and the vandals and the visigoths okay and we know in 476 a.d is going to be the vandals and the visigoths that crush the western portion of the roman in empire and send europe into what's known as the dark ages and this is who the moors are going to fight against in 711 a.d now who were the moors the moors ancestors were known as the garamantes the, uh, these were a black african people living throughout north africa hannibal barca who we talked about last class hannibal barca and we talked about uh the battle of Canaan 216 bc and 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 hannibal across uh, the alps uh 219 uh, bc we talked about the battle of zama in 202 bc where Publius cornelius scipio defeats Hannibal Barca. And then after that defeat, uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio takes the surname Africanus after he defeats Hannibal Barca at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. Okay. So when you register for the course, you can uh, watch uh, 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 last week's class where we dealt with Hannibal and uh, uh, the Carthaginians and the Punic Wars. Now, the Moors, according to George G.M. James in the book Stolen Legacy, were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. These teachings will bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. Unfortunately, everything we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. It was it was to our detriment. It wasn't to our benefit. It was all to our detriment. Now, this is not a this is not a racist statement or a hateful statement. Anything like that is factual. Everything we taught them, the Moors introduced cotton and sugar into Europe. Okay, they're going to introduce, uh, they introduce, uh, they call alchemy, which today we call 
chemistry. They introduced the periodic tables, they introduced different types of food and store system, and, and, uh, systems for storing food, uh, different types of agricultural techniques, uh, all different types of things like this. And everything we taught Europeans came to kick us in the behind. They're going to introduce a long stick called a fire stick that that uh, uses gunpowder and, and, and fires one projectile. Europeans uh, in the mid 14th century are going to produce the first firearm from that. And from that is downhill, because if you study the, if you study the transatlantic slave trade, what gave Europeans such an advantage was that, that they had the gun, they had firearms, they had the cannon and they had the Bible. They had the gun, the cannon. The cannon was one of the most destructive uh, weapons, okay? They had the gun, the cannon, and the Bible, all right? All three destructive weapons. Then, now, this is not anti-Christian. This is not against the Bible. It's against the misusage of the Bible. We have to understand the difference. The, a gun in the right hand can save your life. In the wrong hand, it can take your life. This is not against the Bible. It's against the misusage of the Bible and Christianity. OK. All right. So um, the word more is derived from the Greek word maros, maros, M-A-U-R-O-S, which literally literally means black or a very dark color. Now, the Romans adopt this word and call them mari, mari, M-A-U-R-I, mari. Um, the mari were a group of uh the, the 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 mari were a northwest uh african people who were very dark skinned a northwest african people who were very dark skinned the romans were referred to the region of northwest africa as mauritania mauritania okay um mauritania is a latin word and means the land of the black skinned people we see the prefix mari m a u r i or you may see it spelled at one point, maybe M-A-U-R-E, but basically the same thing. Mauritania is Latin. It means the land of the black skinned people. You will also see or hear the term Marish, M-A-U-R-I-S-H. Now, the Romans later adopt the word as a reference for the black skinned inhabitants they encounter in Africa. Uh, read Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Uh, pages uh, 527 and 187, because this is one of the uh, books that we use in the class. Go, now, you don't have to buy any of these books, okay, just so you understand, but we use them as reference to document what we're talking about. Now, when we look at um, Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., a lot of people read this book in high school, Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. Well, check this out. He talks about the Moors in the book. Page 40 of the sixth edition, uh, page 40 of the sixth edition, chapter two, in the chapter called um, Africa's Past, I think uh, the chapter is called. Um, what's the name of that chapter? It's page 40 begins before. Oh, OK, chapter two is called Before the Mayflower. The, fir the first chapter is called um, the first chapter is called The African Past. OK, so on page 40. Lerone Bennett Jr. is talking about in the 17th century, the 1600s, in the land that we call the United States, specifically in the territory that becomes the 13 colonies. OK. And he's talking about the fact that um, in this time, at the time like 1619, that we keep hearing about, August 20th, 1619, when the White Lion pirate ship comes into uh, Virginia, it comes actually into Hampton, Virginia. He's talking about the fact that at this point in time, when number one, you don't have codified slave laws, because codified, codified slave laws don't come into existence until 1641 in Massachusetts. So those 20 and odd Africans that we keep hearing about reading about in the city project um those 29 africans are, are put into a form of indentured servitude and they were released after three because what we know is chattel slavery even codified slave laws don't exist in any of the 13 colonies at this time uh they come to connecticut in about 1650 Virginia about 1660 1661 but the term white generally speaking is not being used in the early 1600s for what we call white people. The term is being used is 
English or Christians, okay? And the term, generally speaking, Negro or Negro in the 13 British colonies is not being used um, as, well, as well, okay? So what he says is, is of all the improbable aspects of this situation, the oddest to modern blacks and whites is that white people did not seem to know that they were white. Now, you know what? Let me see. I have a better, um, I have a, hold on. Let me pull this up because I scanned this, um, uh, I scanned this page. So we have a better version of this because it's hard to see it on the slide. Let's see. Uh, let's pull this up. Pull this up from before the Mayflower right here because I have it in the uh, format. Okay, I just want to get out of this class. So uh, you all can register for the class right now or soon as uh, I'm done with this. Uh, this is just a sample of the type of information that you'll get in the class. And we do, I do a public references, articles, or clips. Uh, the class is very thoroughly documented there's probably 60 70 articles that we cover i created the curriculum i've been teaching this class on and off since 2017. okay so this is page 40 you should be able to see this much better this is page 40 of before the mayflower by Laurent bennett jr okay now what he says is let's scroll down here this is the sixth edition the sixth edition of all of the improbable aspects of this situation the oddest to modern blacks and whites is that white people did not seem to know that they were white white people did not seem to know that they were white it appears from surviving evidence that the first colonist the first colonist had no concept of themselves as white people. Okay, he's talking about in the early 1600s in what would become the, the British colony, the 13 British colonies. The legal documents, the legal documents identified whites as Englishmen and or Christians. The word white with its burden of arrogance and biological pride developed late in the century okay developed late in the century late in the 17th century basically after bacon's rebellion of 1675 and 1676 in the colony of virginia it's going to be about 1781 that in virginia they introduced the term white to break up the alliance between enslaved africans free africans uh african indentured servants and white indentured servants and poor whites because there was an alliance against them and they united uh, all of these groups united in uh, in Bacon's rebellion against the ruling elite who were exploiting uh, these people's labor on the tobacco plantations in the colony of Virginia because they realized that they had a common enemy. So they united and actually during Bacon's rebellion, they're going to burn down uh, uh, Jamestown, Virginia. OK, this is in 1676. All right. Now, the word white with this burden of arrogance and biological pride developed late in the century as a direct result of slavery and organized debasement of blacks or African people. The same point can be made from the other side of the line. The same point can be made from the other side of the line for a long time in colonial America. There was no legal name. Uh, to focus uh, white anxiety. The first blacks were called blackamores, moors, nagers, N-E-G-E-R-S, or nagars, N-E-G-A-R-S, okay? So, there, so what he's saying is, is that African people in the British colonies were called moors or blackamores. They largely weren't called Negroes, largely weren't called blacks. OK, and then when you read the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705 and they have a PDF of Virginia.org, you read the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705. 
the uh, section four of the Virginia slave codes uh, make a distinction between Negroes and Moors and the treatment of Negroes and Moors. Okay, uh, that's the uh, Virginia slave code of 1705. And it's that Encyclopedia of Virginia. I did a whole presentation on this recently. I was speaking at a um, environmental um, uh, conference. But if we look at uh, Encyclopedia of Virginia, where is that? Uh, it's at encyclopediaofvirginia.org. Uh, Let's see. Uh, okay, yeah, an act of concerning this right here. Primary documents. Okay. Um, I'll show you that in just a second here. Then I have to get out here to teach this class. Um, okay, let's look at this here. Okay, the word negro or negro, a Spanish and Portuguese term for black, did not come into general use in Virginia until the later part of the century. That's the later part of the 1700s. That's after 1681. This, so this is when you're going to have uh, 1681. Basically, you're going to have the term white introduced in the colony of Virginia, and then it's going to be adopted by the other colonies. And then the word negro is going to be introduced as well, um, largely being used uh, right around that same time. And what, what, the, what they're trying to do is break up the alliance between poor whites and white indigenous servants and enslaved Africans, free African people and African slaves. They're trying to break up that alliance. So they break up that alliance by the by the by the uh, by the distinct by the distinctions, by the names they use for those groups of people. And then the names that they use for those groups of people uh, that helps to determine how those groups of people are treated, the status that they have, the types of privileges that they have, et cetera. OK, so this is what. Uh, Lerone Bennett Jr. is explaining. Now, if we look at very quickly here, if we look at the um, uh, Encyclopedia of uh, Virginia, uh, Encyclopedia Virginia.org, okay, primary document and act concerning servants and slaves, 1705. This deals with the uh, Virginia slave codes of 1705, okay. Um, Okay, we scroll down here. They have some of the original documents. Uh, in an act concerning servants and slaves passed by the General Assembly in the session of October 1705, Virginia's colonial government collects old and, collects old and establishes new laws with regards to indentured servants and slaves. So if we skip over, you can read the rest of this. I don't have time to get through all, the, all of it. I want to go to section four. Section four, Roman numeral four. OK. Um, it says and also be enacted by the authority aforesaid. And it is hereby enacted that all servants imported and brought into this country by sea or land who were not Christians in their native country, except Turks and Moors in amity with her majesty and others that can make due proof of their being free in England or any other Christian country before they, okay, were before they were shipped in order to, uh, to transportation hither, shall be accounted and be slaves, shall be accounted and be slaves. So it's what it's saying is, is that Moors are exempt from the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705. And, the, and, and, and they're making the distinction between the, the classification of Moors and the classification of Negroes, okay? Because the Negroes are the ones who are going to be enslaved, shall be accounted and be slaves, and such be here bought and sold, notwithstanding a conversion to Christianity afterward, okay? You can go back and read the whole thing, but this is now what's hap what happens is, is the Virginia slave codes versions of this get adopted by the other 13 colonies okay and this helps to form what we call race in this country and it deals with racism
okay? Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy for the purpose of preserving genetic white survival on a planet that's less than 10% European. All right, now, so we we go throughout history and we, you know, look at, um, uh, we look at thousands of years of history, but the section Moors, you know, we look at the, uh, uh, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad and, and the Moors going into the Iberian Peninsula, 711 AD, and where uh, the Moors land of that rock promontory um, is called uh, Jebel Tariq, Jebel Tariq, okay, today, uh, or is translated as Tariq's Mountain, okay, today we call it the Rock of Gibraltar, okay, uh, Jebel Tariq, Tariq's Mountain, or Gibraltar, or the Rock of Gibraltar, is named after an, an African Moor, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. Okay, so all this relates to African history. All this relates uh, to our history. Relates to who we are. Okay, uh, we deal with things like why do you have Moors' heads on the national flags of Corsica and Sardinia? Corsica is a French island in the Mediterranean and um uh sardinia is a uh italian island in the mediterranean and the moors were in those areas okay uh and it took a monumental effort to defeat them so you have uh, african moors heads on the national flags right now uh in uh corsica and sardinia and a lot of people don't know that these African people don't know why those Moors heads are there, anything like that. Okay, so all this relates to our history. Uh, and the people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems in the past, in the present and the future uh, to meet the needs of the community. Then, and, and we also have to deal with things like Christopher Columbus and Columbus helps to uh, greatly spread the transatlantic slave trade. Columbus operating on behalf of the Spanish crown. And then uh, we look at where Columbus goes on his four voyages and he conquers, you know, the Bahamas and Hispaniola, the Western third of the island of Hispaniola, Hispaniola is where we have Haiti. Uh, he conquers Cuba and Jamaica and uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Panama, Honduras, et cetera. And these uh, nations that he conquers, these island nations in Central America, et cetera, and the Caribbean, they have never recovered from what happened to them over 500 years ago. All right. And this is going to lead to things like the Asiento de Negros of 1518 um, and uh, King Charles V. Uh, the Asiento, which greatly expands the transatlantic slave trade. OK, so this is just a, a sample of the type of information we deal with in this uh, 10 week online course. Actually, this time around, we're going to do 12 weeks because some of them I had to break up into uh, one hour sessions. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, right. We have the information right on the homepage. You'll see the information for uh, my radio show. And then you scroll down, and uh, we have um, my 15 uh, lecture download bundle pack. 15 of my lectures is on sale, $50, regularly $150, makes a great gift. Uh, but we have uh, the online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We usually do it Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm running behind schedule today. We're about to teach this class. It's on sale, $60, regularly $130. Uh, you can watch classes on demand. You can join us live in class, and uh, all the sessions are, are recorded after we do them. So... You can go back and watch it anytime. A year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. Okay, I'm going to post the link here. Once again, we have it in the thread of the broadcast. Uh, so you can uh, register right now, join us in class. You can use this information with your children as well. I will say the information is uh, PG-13. Uh, it's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing, anything like that. So you can use this uh, information with your children, use it with your families. Uh, Etc. and get the bundle pack because the bundle pack for hundred dollars is a huge value um because it's like a 260 dollars value normally of course is 130 dollars each you get two four hundred dollars you can watch from around the world and um the the content will blow you away okay this is the binder uh I actually have a put 
all the content in the binder. So I have a binder that I teach from where we have the curriculum, we have uh, the articles, um, all of that. And then there's like seven books that we use um, in the classes in the class as well. OK. Uh, also, if you uh, want to support the African History Network, dial sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, um, et cetera. And we have the information on the home page of our website right here. Um, also, and if you click on the Cash App link, it takes you to our QR code uh, for, for Cash App as well. Okay. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent. Uh, if you like this type of information, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this blog. If you like this type of information, did you learn anything from this? If you learned uh, from this, if I talked about two, three, four, five things you did not know, when you register for the class, it's totally going to blow your mind. It'll totally change the way that you look uh, at history. OK, remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.